Um, my name is Charlotte Boyd. I serve as the chair of the KBA Standards and Appeals Committee, and that's the committee that's responsible for developing the KBA guidelines. Um, so similar to the, the Standards and Petitions Subcommittee for the IUCN Red List. Um, I also serve as um, with Conservation International as Africa Oceans Fellow, so you'll probably um, see quite a strong Africa flavor and a marine flavor in this presentation today. So I'll go ahead now and share my screen. Sorry, I'm in Kenya, so you may hear some weird noises outside. Um, hope that's not too much of a distraction. So hopefully you can now see uh, my title slide. Yes, looks good. Great. So I think most of the participants in today's webinar also participated in, sorry, I'm just gonna hide something, also participated in the first webinar in the series in which Andy Plumtree provided an overview of KBAs and their relevance to IUCN SCC, SSC members. And I don't want to repeat too much of that today, but for those who weren't able to attend, I'll start with a very brief introduction to KBAs. I'll then provide an overview of the KBA criteria, followed by a more in-depth look at how the criteria are applied, focusing on criterion A1, which identifies sites for threatened species, and highlighting the importance of information that may be found in the IUCN Red List accounts. I'll then give a much shorter introduction to some of the other species-based criteria together with some examples. And I'll try and keep the presentation fairly short um, so that there'll be plenty of time for, for discussion. So just this weekend, the Guardian newspaper had a cartoon by First Dog on the Moon that put forward three easy steps to stop species becoming extinct. And first, you must genuinely want no more extinctions. Second, you must stop chopping down and digging out the places where these plants and animals live. So as I'm sure we're all well aware, safeguarding habitat is an essential conservation strategy for most threatened and also most geographically restricted species. And there are many places where habitat loss or other site-based pressures threaten multiple species at the same site. So there's now broad global support for safeguarding sites in terrestrial, freshwater and marine systems. But site protection is most efficient if we know which areas in the world contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And as Andy discussed in the first webinar, the CBD specifically recognizes the need to conserve areas of particular importance for biodiversity, both in the Aichi targets and most recently in the global biodiversity framework. So how do we identify these sites? BirdLife International's success at identifying and conserving important sites for birds as IBAs has led to similar approaches being developed for other taxonomic groups. However, the challenge is that identification of multiple overlapping sites for different taxa based on slightly different criteria presents real challenges for conservation planners who are then less likely to incorporate those into planning processes. So the KBA standard was developed to provide an umbrella framework that harmonizes existing approaches to identifying important sites. Following an extensive global consultation process that took over four years and involved a broad array of experts and end users, the KBA standard was formally adopted by IUCN and launched at the World Conservation Congress in 2016. It provides a globally standardized science-based approach for identifying KBAs. And like the IUCN Red List, this approach is based on a set of definitions, criteria, and quantitative thresholds designed to ensure that KBA identification is objective, repeatable, and transparent. So KBAs are defined as sites contributing significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And that reference to sites is important. KBAs are sites with delineated boundaries. KBA standard defines a site as a geographical area on land and or in water with defined boundaries that is actually or potentially manageable as a single unit, such as a protected area or other managed conservation unit. So KBAs are sites, not landscapes or regions. There's no minimum or maximum size for a KBA, but the manageability requirement effectively places a context dependent constraint on the maximum size of the KBA. It's also important because manageable sites are much more likely to be managed for conservation of biodiversity. 
So while it may seem at first sight that, sorry for the pun, it may seem initially that delineating sites based on ecological um, boundaries might make more sense than management boundaries. Actually, if we want these sites to feed into um, conservation planning processes and then be um, managed for conservation purposes, delineating sites in a way that is such that they're actually or potentially manageable can really help to enhance that. KBAs can be identified in marine, freshwater, terrestrial, and even subterranean systems. And they're identified using criteria that are designed to capture elements of biodiversity across genetic species and ecosystem levels, following the CBD's definition of biodiversity. And it's worth noting here that most previous approaches to identifying important sites have been species focused. So the KBA standard goes beyond that to include both species and ecosystem based criteria, although I'll focus mostly on species based criteria today. And genetic diversity is also addressed under some of the, the species-based criteria, but I'm not going to go into detail about that today. Collectively, the criteria aim to capture the various ways in which a site can be important for the global persistence of biodiversity, because it holds threatened biodiversity, geographically restricted biodiversity, has outstanding ecological integrity, maintains key biological processes, or is shown to be highly irreplaceable through quantitative analysis. Altogether, there are 11 criteria grouped into five high-level criteria, A through E. So sites triggering criterion A are important for globally threatened biodiversity. They hold a significant proportion of the global population of a species at risk of extinction under A1, or a significant proportion of an ecosystem type at risk of collapse under A2. So if these sites were to disappear, the risk of species extinction or ecosystem collapse would greatly increase. Sites triggering criterion B are important for biodiversity that is geographically restricted. These sites hold a significant proportion of the global population of an individual geographically restricted species under B1, co-occurring restricted range species under B2, geographically restricted species assemblages under B3, or geographically restricted ecosystem types under B4. And I'll talk a bit more about the difference between the distinction between B1, B2, and B3 later on. And by definition, there are relatively few sites where geographically restricted biodiversity exists. So again, there are few spatial options for safeguarding the biodiversity found at these sites. Criterion C sites, again, this is an innovation in the KBA standard, have outstanding ecological integrity at a global scale. So sites with outstanding ecological integrity are globally rare and provide the few remaining options for conserving relatively intact ecological communities alongside the key ecological processes at a sea or landscape scale. Sites triggering criterion D maintain important biological processes that are geographically restricted. D1 sites hold a significant proportion of the global population of a species while aggregated for life history processes such as feeding, breeding, or migration. D2 sites sustain a significant proportion of a species global population during periods of environmental stress, such as severe drought or warm water events. And D3 sites produce a very high proportion of the propagules, larvae, or juveniles required to maintain the global adult population of a species that disperses elsewhere. So as with criterion B, there are relatively few sites where such geographically restricted biological processes occur. So again, there are a few spatial options for safeguarding these processes. Finally, sites triggering criterion E have very high irreplaceability for the global persistence of biodiversity as identified through a complementarity-based quantitative analysis of irreplaceability using techniques derived from systematic conservation planning and tools such as MarkSan or prior Prioritizer. Criterion E identifies sites that are irreplaceable because of their combination of biodiversity features and may identify exceptional areas that do not meet any of the other criteria. However, in practice, preliminary analysis um, in South Africa is indicating, and South Africa has a very strong background in systematic conservation planning, preliminary analysis indicates that most sites that will be identified through criterion E are picked up by the other criteria, um, 
And, and so it's really serving as a cross check. All sites should be assessed against as many KVA criteria and for as many taxonomic groups and ecosystem types as possible, even though a site needs to meet the thresholds for only one criterion to qualify as a KVA. So while you could focus your analysis on criterion E only, we would strongly recommend that you look at criteria A, B, C, D, and E. Assessing sites for multiple biodiversity elements and against multiple criteria will strengthen the robustness of KBA identification to changes in the status of particular trigger species or ecosystem types. So I'm going to focus the rest of the presentation just on the species criteria. And for all species-based criteria, the thresholds in the global KBA standard are designed to be applied at the species level. So subspecies, subpopulations, or varieties cannot trigger global KBAs except through the distinct genetic um, diversity parameter, which can, uh, can be used to, to identify sites for, for subpopulations that have distinct genetic diversity. Another important point is the taxonomy used for KBA identification needs to be consistent with the taxonomy used in the IUCN red list assessments. So species that have not yet been assessed for the IUCN red list can still trigger KBAs under some criteria, but first we need to confirm the taxonomy with the relevant IUCN Red List Authority. And for migratory species with spatially segregated life cycle processes, such as breeding, feeding, and migration, the species-based criteria can generally be triggered separately by mature individuals in each space, spatially segregated life history process. So in this webinar, I'm going to focus on um, the steps for applying criterion one, A1 for globally threatened species, but most of these steps are also used for other species criteria. So the first step in applying criterion A1 is to identify globally threatened species based on the IUCN red list. And any species listed as critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable on the global red list can trigger KBAs under criterion A1. However, given that many species have not yet been assessed for the IDCN red list, criterion A1 may also be applied to species that have not yet been assessed at the global level, are endemic to a specific region or country, and have been assessed as regionally or nationally threatened based on regional application of the IUCN red list categories and criteria. And there's much more detail about that in the KBA guidelines. So as for the IUCN red list, many of the criteria include sub-criteria that describe explicitly how a site contributes to the global persistence of biodiversity. Criterion A1 has five sub-criteria. And when applying this criterion, the next step after identifying the threatened species is to determine which of those five sub-criteria is appropriate for the species. And for the majority of globally threatened species, the applicable sub-criterion will be A1A or A1B. And A1A applies to all critically endangered or endangered species, and A1B applies to all vulnerable species. A1C, D, and E are applied in exceptional cases only. So A1A, A1C and D are intended for limited application to species that have experienced or are currently experiencing rapid decline in population size. We actually use the IUCN red list assessments to identify eligible species. So eligible species are those that are listed as globally threatened based on criterion on IUCN red list criterion A, which refers to population size reduction, but not to those that are listed only under A3 because that is future population reduction that hasn't happened yet. Subcriterion A1E is also a special case. It only applies to critically endangered or endangered species if effectively the entire global population size occurs at a single site. And this is designed to align with the definition of alliance for zero extinction sites. Once the appropriate subcriterion has been determined, the next step is to check the threshold. As I mentioned, the KBA criteria have quantitative thresholds designed to ensure that KBAs are identified in a way that is objective, repeatable, and transparent. And these thresholds were developed through a series of technical workshops and testing with data sets covering diverse taxonomic groups, systems, and regions. And for globally threatened species, the thresholds are very low, but still considered globally significant. And this effectively builds a precautionary approach into the thresholds themselves. And that's quite different from the approach to um, precaution that's used in the IUCN red list assessments. 
For each species that can trigger criterion A1, the relevant threshold depends on the applicable subcriterion. That's for A1A, which is for critically endangered or endangered species, the population size threshold is 0.5% of the global population size with a reproductive units threshold of five reproductive units. And for A1B, the population size threshold is 1% with a reproductive units threshold of 10 reproductive units. And for all species or almost all species based criterion, the population size thresholds are defined in terms of the percentage of the global population size at a site. That means for each possible trigger species, we need to compare the site population size to the global population size to see whether the relevant threshold is met. And population size is, is measured conceptually in terms of mature individuals. And this, facilitate, this is designed to facilitate application of the KBA thresholds across species with very different life history traits. And we use the same definition of mature individuals as for the IUCN Red List. So for any species for which it, that's not obvious, it's really helpful if the Red List account provides a clear explanation of how mature individuals are identified. One unusual example is African wild dogs. So the number of mature individuals there is based primarily on the number of alpha males and alpha females rather than on all sexually mature adults. Many species-based criteria also have a second threshold that relates to the number of reproductive units present at the site. And this is intended to ensure that each trigger species occurs at the site in sufficient numbers for the population to maintain itself beyond the current generation. It's not meant to, to be as much as a minimum viable population, but sites with very few individuals should generally not be identified as KBAs. And this reproductive units threshold is especially important for species with very small global population sizes, given that the population size threshold is a percentage. So if you only have 100 mature uh, individuals globally, then a site that um, holds 1% may qualify under A1, but that's only one individual, so it's unlikely to, to persist beyond the current generation. So reproductive unit is defined as the minimum number and combination of mature individuals necessary to trigger a successful reproductive event at a site. And examples of 10 reproductive units are 10 breeding pairs or 10 reproducing females plus one male in a harem. And as with mature individuals, if the definition of reproductive unit is not obvious for a species, it's really helpful to include this information in the Red List account. And for plants, for example, simply indicating whether the species is monoecious or dioecious is really helpful. It can be quite hard to find that information if you're not a botanist. And but for other species, such as the African wild dog, for example, um, uh, definition of reproductive unit may be quite different. Again, the African wild dog is fairly exceptional, but in that case, each pack is considered a reproductive unit. So ideally, we would always use the number of mature assessment parameter, as this provides the most direct information on population distribution. But the KBA standard is designed to be flexible to enable the identification of KBAs for biodiversity elements with more limited data. So if estimates of numbers of mature individuals are not available, there are several proxy parameters that can be used instead. And these are area of occupancy, extent of suitable habitat, range and number of localities. And for some of the species criteria, distinct genetic diversity can also be used as an assessment parameter, but this is quite different from the other parameters in that it's not intended to serve as a proxy for population size. So it's really helpful if IUCN Red List accounts provide a clear estimate of the global population size using whichever assessment parameter is most relevant for the species. So if it's possible to estimate the number of mature individuals, then it's great to have a clear single best estimate, even if the account then goes on to indicate the uncertainty around that figure. In many cases, the headline estimate is actually a range. So if it's 5,000 to 15,000 blue whales, for example, then we'll take the median of 10,000 um, blue whales as our best estimate, unless the account indicates something different. For area of occupancy, it's important that estimates used in the Red List and KBA assessments are consistent. And this is challenging because AOO isn't always mapped for Red List assessments, but it does need to be mapped for KBA assessments. So if you do map it, 
for the red list assessments, then providing spatial data on KV, um, providing spatial data on AOO to the KBA Secretariat is really useful. The KBA Secretariat can then store those data and KBA assessors can overlay site boundaries to estimate the proportion of AOO that falls within a site. Extent of suitable habitat um, is very similar to area of habitat. It's not actually used in red list assessments, but it is defined using information on suitable habitat that's compiled during red listing. So there's still quite a strong link there. In practice, many KBA assessments, and perhaps most even, are based on IUCN red list range maps. So high quality, well-refined range maps can really help with identifying important sites. So if you imagine you have a site that genuinely holds say 1% of the global distribution of a species, that site is much more likely to be identified using range. If range is well-refined and actually closely aligns with the true distribution of the species versus a very large kind of amorphous blob. Locality data are also widely used, especially for plants. And for KBA assessment, each locality should represent a discrete subpopulation. So the definition of locality is quite different from the definition of location that's used in IUCN red list assessments. Nevertheless, we find that KBA assessors often use number of locations in red list accounts as a proxy for number of localities. And in some cases that, that's completely appropriate, but it's not always the case. So if number of locations is given in the red list account, it's really helpful to note whether this equates to number of discrete subpopulations. Sub once we've compiled the available data on all the assessment parameters available and selected the most appropriate assessment parameter for the species, the next step is to assess whether the species meets the relevant population size threshold of the site. And for all sites, with very few exceptions, KBA identification requires the recent confirmed presence at the site of the species or ecosystem that triggers the KBA criteria. So ideally, the data used to confirm presence will not be more than eight to 12 years old at the time of KBA identification, but we recognize that often data that recent is not available, and so there is some flexibility on that. And I do want to, to highlight here that I think this is actually a really important element of the KBA standard um, compared to some other conservation prioritization mechanisms in that it does require confirmation of, of the species or ecosystem at the site. So we're not saying that a site is globally important for biodiversity for species X, Y, and Z, if species X, Y, and Z don't actually occur there. And for geographically concentrated species, many red list accounts actually include information on sites where the species is currently known to occur. And that is really useful to us. So I'll provide a brief example of criterion A1 in practice. We have many, many examples here, but I've just picked this one. The Kiritamati reed warbler is listed as endangered on the IUCN red list because of its restricted geographic distribution. So it's eligible to cri trigger criterion A1, and as it's endangered, it's mo more specifically eligible to trigger subcriterion A1A. The global population size is estimated at approximately 6,250 mature individuals. And Kiritamati, which is a large coral atoll in the central Pacific Ocean, holds approximately 267 of those mature individuals. So this represents more than 4% of the global population size, which is well above the population size threshold of 0.5% under subcriterion A1A. So following confirmation of presence, including at least five reproductive units, which are breeding pairs for this species, Kiritamati has been confirmed as a KBA for the Kiritamati reed warbler. So I'll now provide a brief look at some of the other criteria, starting with criterion B1, which identifies sites holding a significant proportion of the global population of one or more individually geographically restricted species. A key point here, which is often overlooked, is any site containing any species whose distribution is so concentrated that 10% or more of the global population size regularly occurs at the site may qualify as a KBA under B1, as long as there are also at least 10 reproductive units at the site. So species triggering B1 do not need to be restricted range, and they don't need to be restricted to an ecoregion or bioregion 
Some species may have relatively broad ranges, but are still highly clumped within that range, and they can still trigger B1. And one important caveat here is that species that are only known from their type locality should not automatically be assumed to be geographically concentrated, as this may indicate undersampling, under especially for species listed as data deficient. And so for species only known from the type locality that are listed as data deficient, it's really useful if the IUCN Red List account notes whether this um, likely represents the true, true distribution of the species or um, limited sampling effort to date. So as an example, the Bayless glider was only discovered in 2007 and has not yet been assessed for the red list, so cannot trigger a KBA under criterion A1. However, it's only known from mid-altitude forests on three isolated mountains in Mozambique, Mount Namuli, Mount Mabu, and Mount Inago. The montane butterflies in this genus are relatively sedentary and generally don't move between distant forest patches. So experts were able to infer that these three known localities represent three distinct subpopulations, each one likely holding more than 10% of the global population size. So all three sites have been confirmed as KBAs for the Bayless Guider under Criterion B1. Sites identified under Criterion B2 hold a significant proportion of the global population size of two or more co-occurring restricted range species within a taxonomic group such as birds, mammals, reptiles, sharks, and rays. And there's a list of appropriate taxonomic groups um, available on the KBA website. So this criterion does focus specifically on restricted range species. And as an example, Genuela Vista in, in Peru has been identified as KBA under criterion B2 for five restricted range reptile species. Sites identified under criterion B3 hold geographically restricted assemblages of species, for example, assemblages of at least five species within a taxonomic group that are restricted to a particular ecoregion or bioregion. A nice example here is the Hohelberg in South Africa, which hosts an amazing diversity of plant species, including hundreds of Erica and Protea species. And it's been identified as a potential KBA under criterion B3 based on 84 species of proteaceae that are restricted to the famous shrub, shrublands ecoregion. And in general, we found that the B criteria are extremely useful for identifying sites that are important for geographically restricted biodiversity that has either not yet been assessed for the red list or doesn't qualify as threatened. Sorry. So the final criterion I'll cover today, uh, criterion D1, is applicable to migratory species that aggregate at high relative abundance in specific sites. So D1 sites hold a significant proportion of the global population of a species while aggregated for life history processes such as feeding, breeding, or migration. And along migration routes, KBA should be identified at key stopover or bottleneck sites but not for the entire migratory corridor. And the reason for that is if we um, did identify entire migration, car migration routes for species such as humpback whales, for example, then we'd end up with the entire coastline of Australia, both east and west, um, the entire East African coastline, for example, all identified as KBAs. And that would really undermine the, the contribution, the value of KBAs to inform conservation planning. Subcriteria. So what that means is not connectivity. Obviously, is also is really important. It just means that um, different processes are needed to identify um, important migration routes and, and areas that are necessary to conserve to maintain connectivity. Subcriterion D1A requires that one percent of the global population size predictably occurs at the site. And if we have relevant data, we can actually apply the subcriteria separately in the breeding range and feeding range of, of the same species. But for many species, we don't have good information on the global number of individuals. So subcriterion D1B allows us to identify any one of the largest 10 aggregations for any species as a KBA. And this applies across all life history functions. Um, so we're looking for the, la the 10 largest aggregations globally, and we don't apply D1B separately to, to breeding aggregations or feeding aggregations. And one final point on this is, um, well, as I mentioned, D1 is designed to, <clears throat> sorry, 
captured sites that are important for aggregations during life history processes, we don't actually need to know why the species is aggregated at a particular site in order to identify that site as an under D1. So for example, there are a number of sites globally where uh, white sharks uh, aggregate in large numbers, but we're not really sure why they're aggregating there. Is it for breeding? Is it for feeding? Is it for some other reason? It would be wonderful to know, but in the meantime, we can still identify that site as important because the species is still predictably occurring there at very high numbers. So an aggregation is defined as a geographically restricted clustering of individuals that typically occurs during a specific life history process, such as breeding, feeding, or migration. But as mentioned, we don't have to know why um, they're aggregating there. It's indicated by highly localized relative abundance, much higher than at other stages of the species life cycle. And even if a species is generally considered congregatory, it can only trigger a KVA under D1 at sites where it, at sites where it aggregates at unusually high population densities. So for example, many seabird species are identified as congregatory and they may well trigger D1 at breeding colonies, but if they disperse broadly um, while foraging, then they probably won't be able to trigger D1 while foraging at sea. There are of course some sites where um, seabirds aggregate to forage at sea, and those are potential could potentially be identified under D1. So, as an example of D1A, the say whale has a very broad global range. It generally occurs at very low densities in offshore waters, but it does also form predictable seasonal feeding aggregations in a few low coastal locations. And the Falkland Islands inner shelf waters were recently confirmed as a KVA for the say whale under subcriterion D1A, based on predictable aggregations at much higher densities than recorded elsewhere in the range. And those aggregations represent at least 1%, or that aggregation represents at least 1% of the global population size, which is estimated at 50,000 mature individuals. So there are at least 500 mature individuals predictably aggregate at that site. It's a lot of whales. KBAs have also been confirmed under criterion D1 based on for more data limited species. So for example, in Mozambique, KBAs have been identified at sites holding globally significant aggregations of oceanic manta ray, reef manta ray, whale shark, zebra shark, and also giant trevally, which is not shown here. Global population sizes are unknown for all those species, but it was still possible to identify KBAs under subcriterion D1B based on information on sites that hold the largest known aggregations for each species. And so for species that aggregate in globally significant numbers, it would be very useful to include information on sites holding the large no largest known aggregations in the red list account. So to sum up, IUCN red list accounts are an extremely valuable resource for KBA assessments. They've already been through an ex expert peer review process. So essentially we treat the red list accounts as gospel and work really hard to ensure that the data used for KBA assessment are consistent with red list accounts. Information can also flow the other way. So KBA assessment involves a substantial data collection effort, especially on distribution patterns and confirmation of presence. And these data can then inform red list assessments. If the KBA assessments uncover new data that's not consistent with the existing red list account, then it may actually be necessary to update the red list account before we can confirm the KBA. So perhaps the best way to ensure consistency between the red list and KBA assessments, and also to ensure that relevant information that is known is included in the red list account, um, perhaps the best way to achieve that is to integrate the two processes. So when you're having um, red list assessment workshops, consider tacking on a couple of days in order to also kind of start the process of KBA assessment. This will likely make the most efficient use of experts' time. And we also think it might help with fundraising to support red listing and perhaps other work of the specialist groups. And I think the final webinar in this series, um, which will focus on Mozambique, will actually provide a really good example of that. And then finally, I'd just like to close by emphasizing that KBA identification provides a really effective bridge between the IUCN assessment processes, so the red list for threatened species, red list um, for ecosystems, 
and conservation planning. And hence, it's a really important step towards conservation action and hopefully the um, persistence of the species that we care about. And this has been a fairly rapid overview of the KBA criteria. There was a lot of information and I'm sure it's gonna be hard to retain all of that. So um, if you want to learn more about any of these criteria, then I would strongly recommend checking out the KBA online training course. This is now available in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And it's hosted on the same conservation training website as um, the IUCN Red List online co training course. Um, modules two and three cover the species-based criteria. So most of the criteria that I've covered um, today. Module four covers the ecosystem-based criteria that I didn't really touch on. And module five then covers some really important um, guidelines on delineation procedures and the requirements for, for stakeholder consultation. And so that's the end of my presentation. And I think we can now open the floor to questions. And I'll stop sharing my, my screen. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so if anyone has questions, uh, the best way to submit them is through the KB, uh, the Q&A, not KBA, feature <laughs> at the bottom of the screen. Um, or if you can't quite see that or figure it out, you can submit them in the chat. Um, we already have a couple here, so I'll just read you the first one, Charlotte. Um, is the AOO measurement approach for KBAs the same method for red list? Um, the AOO measurement in the red list is a sum from the species global range. Yes, that's correct. So um, we do use exactly the same definition of AOO as for the IUCN red list. And as you note, that's only estimated at the, um, at the global level. And so this is why I said that if, if as a part of the process of estimating the global AOO, you do actually map AOO, then it's really helpful if you um, retain that spatial data and actually send it to the KBA secretary so they can store that. Because then that, what that means is it enables a KBA assessor to come and simply overlay a site boundary on the global AOO map and estimate it that way. The, the challenge is if AOO isn't mapped is just simply estimated for the red list account, the KBA assessors really need to map it in order to use AOO um, in the, the KBA assessment, but they might actually, if they end up defining AOO in a slightly different way or making different inferences about whether a particular area is occupied or not, then we'll end up with different results and we don't want that. So again, if I know that AOO isn't, often isn't always mapped but when it's used in red list assessments but if it is mapped that's great and please do send that information to the kba secretariat great um can you clarify which criteria aze sites can possibly fulfill yes yeah, so a a1e is the sub criterion that is specifically designed to um to align with the aze criteria so a1e is um, can be triggered by species that are critically endangered or endangered and effectively their entire population size occurs at a single site. Um, A1E sites may, sorry, AZE sites uh, will often um, trigger other criteria as well. So you may well have a site that's an AZE site that triggers both A1E and A1A, for example, because A1A is relevant to critically endangered and endangered species in general. And the only reason why an AZEC site wouldn't trigger A1A is if numbers are so, so low that they don't meet the reproductive units threshold. Okay. Um, are there examples of data flowing the other way from KBA assessment to red listing? So absolutely yes. And I can't quite put my um yes i can't think of any examples off the top of my head um i think i'm pretty sure there is at least one example where we kind of looked at um distribution patterns for or rather the relevant experts looked at distribution patterns for a pinniped and kind of compared that to the red list and realized that actually being a kind of just an error in, in the red list account and that led to a correction in the red list account because it was a clear error rather than didn't affect the overall threat assessment. Um, 
So that's one example, but I'm sure there are others and there will be many more. And I, it will be interesting to see actually whether the Mozambique presentation that is the last one in this um, webinar series can provide a good example. Um, but yeah, apologies, because I can't think of any off the top of my head. Great. Uh, does a habitat of an endemic species meet the KBA criteria? So the challenge with the term endemic is we need to know what it's endemic to. So um, for example, if a species is endemic to an ecoregion and co-occurs with a number of other species in the same taxonomic group at the same site that are also endemic to an ecoregion, then that can trigger um, a KBA under B3. Um, similarly, if um, for bioregions, for some species like taxonomic groups like mammals and, and birds, we really kind of, we use kind of the bioregion scale, which is larger than the ecoregion scale. Um, a lot of restricted range species may also be considered endemic. So a lot of restricted range species um, may be endemic to a particular country. And then finally, there's another sub criterion that hasn't really been used yet, B3C, which is designed to, um, yeah, I don't think that would really capture your endemic issue because that's designed for species that are geographically concentrated, but for which we don't have a good understanding of their global range. Um, and another thing to mention there is, I mean, the, the global KBA standard that I'm talking about is about identifying global KBAs, but Canada has um, decided that they also want to, to do a national KBA assessment. So they've actually developed a national KBA standard that parallels the KBA global KBA standard. And they're using that to um, assess species that are um, maybe even more broadly distributed, but they're focusing on the, um, the population that occurs within the country. All right. Um... So someone says, thanks for including sharks in your examples. Could you please clarify how marine and freshwater species that are not as evident and noticeable as whales and manta rays should be dealt with? I'm thinking about smaller and demersal species like rays. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And, you know, I think certainly one of the, the challenges with KBAs is that they are they do require some data. So, um, but those flexible assessment parameters that I mentioned earlier are really helpful here. So if you have a good understanding of the range um, of a species, so some sharks and rays, many of them are broadly distributed, but some are much more concentrated. So if we do have an understanding of um, what the, the range is, then we can use range as an assessment parameter. Um, we do need to have confirmation of presence. Um, and one of the challenges there actually is reproductive units. But, you know, in some cases, it will be necessary to, to go back to the field to actually um, confirm that the species are there in the site in numbers that, that um, would meet the reproductive unit threshold. And while that might mean a delay in um, identifying a site as a KBA for that species, it can often also be used as a to help fundraise to support that survey work. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it is actually a really important element of the KBA standard that it does require confirmation of presence. Um, yep. Okay. Um, are there any plans for including urban greenscapes under KBAs? So that's an interesting question. I mean. Any site that meets the criteria, doesn't matter whether it's in a rural area or an urban area, um, as long as it meets the criteria and thresholds can be considered a KBA. And there's actually a couple of interesting examples from South Africa. So South Africa has completed a comprehensive assessment in terrestrial systems. And they've identified some sites in the heart of Cape Town that um, have the meet the KBA criteria. And so they're actually looking at how they are, they're gonna um, propose this as KBAs and really the challenge then is, uh, is how to aggregate those sites. Can you include a, um, are they gonna use all these individual tiny patches as KBAs or are they gonna kind of aggregate them together and propose a single KBA that has disjunct patches? And I didn't talk at all about delineation today because there was already a lot of information to cover, but um, it's certainly possible to, to include um, 
KBAs to identify KBAs in urban areas. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a bit of a longer one. So um, someone uh, is commenting, they work for a local government, their boundaries overlap with the KBA. Um, their city has a biodiversity conservation strategy. Uh, they have connected with the regional and national KBA folks there, but as the local government, they're still trying to figure out how they fit in with the KBA approach because it's not tied to legislated protection. Right. Um, so they're wondering, is there any guidance or direction for local governments on working with KBAs and how you communicate this to officials? So interesting question. Um, so yes, one a key aspect of KBAs is that um, they're not they don't feed directly into into legislation. And I think that's actually important because if it did feed into directly into legislation, let's say you know there was the law in one country was all KBAs must be protected areas of a particular um, uh, category then that could actually start to, to affect the or influence the, the KBA assessment process. And we might see some sites that really do meet the KBA criterion thresholds not being proposed because people are concerned that they might become a protected area. And that's not necessarily like creating a national park or something or even a state park is not necessarily the, the right conservation action for, for all KBAs. There's, quite a wide range of ways in which those sites could be managed. So it's important that um, KBAs don't, um, generally don't feed directly into legislation. Um, I can't really comment on the BC case because I don't know the kind of the, the local, the legal planning framework there very well, but I can give you some examples from other countries that might be useful. So in South Africa, they have a planning process that includes um, CBAs, which are critical biodiversity areas. Um, and then they also have ESAs, which are ecological supporting areas. I think I've got those acronyms right. And so the CBAs are part of the, the planning framework, um, the sort of high category CBAs. There's quite, there are some restrictions in how those areas can be developed. And what's happening then is the KBA process is being used to inform um, the CBAs. So um, many of the CBAs actually have ended up being identified as potential KBAs, but there are a few sites that are being identified as potential KBAs that aren't currently recognized as CBAs, but the CBA process gets list gets updated periodically. And so those sites are now going to be, um, those KBAs that are not CBAs will probably be proposed as CBAs in the future. So that's the way that it feeds into the, the local planning process. Um, I'll touch on another example very briefly because I think we'll hear more about it in the fourth webinar, but in Mozambique, the, um, the they've identified about 29 KBAs and those have been in terrestrial and marine systems and those have actually just been fed directly into the national territorial plan and marine plan. Um, but that still means that the work will be need to need to be done to decide, you know, how to how to effectively conserve those areas. So um, I think what you're doing is exactly right to to reach out to the national region regional KBA folks and have that discussion. But I think the answer to that question is going to depend a lot on certainly the national context and very often even the kind of the the local context, especially in federal systems. All right. Uh, is there any method or tool to measure ecosystem integrity? That is a very challenging question. And we actually, as I mentioned, um, Criterion C is, is very innovative and in it's the first criterion included in a site in any of these approaches for identifying important sites that really gets at integrity. We actually had, we've had a lot of debate about how to identify those sites. And um, the KBA guidelines provide, um, there's a whole chapter that's dedicated to, to sites with outstanding ecological integrity, and it provides a framework for identifying those sites. Um, but there isn't a single tool. I think that I would argue that there's a, a framework and a methodology that you can use and, and do take a look at the KBA guidelines. And uh, Julia, maybe we can include a link to the KBA guidelines in the, yeah chat I should have suggested that earlier 
it's on the KBA website. So if you just look for www.keybiodiversityareas.org, you can find the KBA guidelines there. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a longer message here. Um, I think I'm reading the message here as well. Yeah, I think this is starting to get at kind of KBA national coordination groups. Um, and that really is a question for Andy. So mm -hmm. uh, we can flag it to him. Um, I know he's been extraordinarily busy recently. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, national we can send a, groups a reminder on for the secretariat. All right. Um, so the reproductive units threshold, does it mean those units are present in the same time window or is it enough if the units are distinct individuals or pairs? Excellent question. So many of the criteria, most of the criteria talk about um, a population that regularly occurs at the site. Um, so that's relatively straightforward for any um, resident species. Um, so you would expect basically what it says, the way I kind of explain it is you should be able to, if you could take a snapshot or use some method that kind of indicated all the more mature individuals in a site, you would expect to see um, that number of individuals there at the site. The um, different um, criterion there is actually criterion D1, which I mentioned that's really designed around the ecology of migratory species. And that actually specifically says in the criterion that the, the threshold needs to be met over a season. And so you can imagine stopover or bottleneck sites where maybe there's only a handful of individuals there on any one day, but over the course of a three week migration season, um, a significant proportion of the, the global population passes through that site. So D1 actually just allow for um, for individuals to, to pass through. Um, yeah. Okay. And then uh, in the marine environment, the CBD recognizes EBSAs. Do KBAs complement these or are they redundant? So actually, um, KBAs, uh, an important motivation for, for, for developing the KBA standard was the um, important role that IBAs, important bird areas, have been had played in informing EBSAs. So for those who are not familiar, EBSAs are a um, category of uh, ecologically and biologically significant areas. They're, they're, um, they fall under the CBD. And there are various criteria, but not any quantitative thresholds. And the criteria actually are quite similar to the KVA criteria and similar to the to the important bird area criteria. So when um, when there were workshops to identify these EBSAs around the world, the IBA data were really important in informing EBSAs and many of the EBSAs are actually based on IBAs. But then the question, the obvious question was raised, well, why are we focusing so much on birds? And the answer was because we don't have a similar um, tool for all the other um, taxonomic groups. So that is a big part of what led to the KBA standard being developed was recognition that we needed to be identifying sites for, for other taxa in order for them to inform um, EPSAs. And generally speaking, the, there's a difference in the process for identifying EPSAs versus um, uh, KBAs. So it's a, it's a slight, rather more closed process. The experts involved are nominated by governments and some governments say, well, we're not gonna identify any EPSAs in our national waters, for example. We're only gonna look beyond in areas beyond national jurisdiction, whereas KBAs um, you know, can be identified anywhere. And it's, it's a less political process, I would say. Um, the other key difference is that EBSAs are often at the seascape scale. So, for example, the entire Humboldt current system, I think, is an EBSA. Um, and KBAs are, are definitely sites. So often when you're actually thinking about how you would manage an EBSA, you go to the KBA information to look at the specific sites that have really um, are really globally significant for biodiversity and need to have 
or may need um, special conservation action in those sites. So very complimentary is the short answer, sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, who can act as a KBA assessor? Can a KBA proposer be an assessor? Yes, so we actually, um, so anyone can, can be a KBA assessor, um, anyone who has access to the data, but we do, and this was something I think that Andy emphasized in the first webinar was we really um, what, wanted to make sure that local expertise is involved in this process as far as possible. And we encourage um, the development of national coordination groups um, and really because they can really facilitate the stakeholder consultation process, which can include consultation with local experts, but also with people who live in the area around a KVA um, and engage them. So anyone can, can be a KBA assessor um, and that basically a KBA assessor, um, there's not a very clear difference between a KBA assessor and a KBA proposer. Um, so anyone can do that. And then there's an independent review process um, that, is, that is followed to ensure um, that KBAs that are proposed do actually meet the criteria and thresholds. All right, uh, that is all the questions I see right now and we're about at an hour. Um, uh, if you have any more that were answered, you can always um, contact us. And I don't know if Charlotte, you wanna put your uh, email in the chat. I'm also sharing just now in the chat, the registration links for our next two webinars, which will be on March 7 and March 21, um, same time as these. Uh, if that works for you, so you're able to register. Um, but thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we will be sharing the recording of this um, in an email uh, after the webinar series ends. And thanks to Charlotte. Great, and thank you very much. And I'm seeing these kind of additional questions in the Q&A regarding Algeria. And I would really encourage you to, to reach out again to Andy Plumtree and feel free to, to CC me. I've just put my email address in the chat, but um, I think there's a lot to discuss there and we'll, we'll make sure that that is addressed. Thank you.